Hello, everybody. Welcome into Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews. My name's Brandon Adams. Happy to have from R.S. Andrews, Dari Payro, along with the entire Dog Nation team, Connor Riley, Jeff Sintel, Mike Griffith, as we break down the upcoming weeks uh, worth of games there in college football and really go through it all. Georgia on the road against Vanderbilt, a preview of the following week's opponent for the Dogs, Arkansas in a big spot in Jerry World against Texas A&M. Interesting national game also taking place at a neutral site between Wisconsin and Notre Dame. We will cover that all throughout our program here today. And, of course, it's all brought to you by our friends at R.S. Andrews. You can find them online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. Obviously, fall weather on its way, but we still got warm weather for right now. That means you want to make sure you are well taken care of when it comes to that A.C. unit. I can't sleep in a high house. So if you know that your air conditioning unit's at its last legs, life expectancy coming to an end, get some new life breathed into it by getting your system tuned back up factory fresh specs it just cost $99 you can find out more online at rsandrews.com before we get into this week's games let us go through what happened a week ago now uh, I've already kind of played today in protest because I was not actually given credit for one of my wins I didn't have very many but I uh, should have gotten credit for one of my wins but for now still wearing the crown at the top of the standings Mike Griffith after a 3-0 week from last week that puts him in 16 and 9 on the year. Of course, you'll be able to see this in your screen. Dari Payro also uh, 3 and 4 last week, 15 and 10 on the year. Connor Riley 2 and 5 last week, winning record for now, though, at 14 and 11. Me, we'll, we'll say 3 and 4 from last week, but officially it's listed there at 2 and 5. Uh, that puts me 11 and 14, or what really should be 12 and 13 on the year. And Jeff Sintel, after a 1 and 6 week a week ago, 10 and 15 on the year. And Connor, I understand that you've got your own version of protest about one of your losses on Saturday. Is that correct? I mean, the referees just stole not just a cover, but a win away from Mississippi State. And it was extremely disgusting to see, you know, the referees take their take their hands and invest it in that game specifically there. I was just thoroughly disappointed. Part of, that's part by of home that field part. advantage. That's part of home field advantage. That's why I said when you play Memphis in the Liberty Bowl, that's the kind of calls they get. As much as it pains me to admit, I do have to agree with Mike on this, that if you're playing a uh, – Group of five team on the road. You can't have it in the hands of the officials, Connor. I mean, I, I mean, these were SEC officials. <laughs> they should have been in the back. My point is, you're supposed to win that game comfortably, so you don't have to worry about that. Of course, officiating was an issue in the Memphis Mississippi State game. Probably one of the worst blown calls I've seen. If you missed it, there was a punt where Memphis had two number fours on the field. The ball should have been down because it was touched by the punting team. Memphis scoops it up and really creates a scoring opportunity that just really changes the momentum of that game. If you believe in momentum, it's certainly certainly changed uh, seemingly the momentum there in that spot. And, of course, the Auburn-Penn State game had its share of officiating blunders there as well. But, Mr. Payro, how do you feel about this? Before we kind of get into it here, that's kind of a big-picture thing. Dari, how are you feeling about the slate of this week's games with Georgia and Nashville and everything else we'll see in the SEC, kind of a precursor to next week where we have maybe the deepest slate of SEC games of all coming up next Saturday. What do you feel about the appetizer around the league before we get to that? Uh, pretty good. I think, uh, you know, there's uh, some, some tricky picks this week. Definitely some tough ones. Yeah, I mean, I find, you know, what's probably the biggest game in the SEC on paper, I, I find that to be a very difficult game to predict, and we'll kind of get into that here coming in a moment. Before that, though, let's talk about the Georgia Bulldogs, 30-plus point favorites at home last week against South Carolina. Easy win, but failing to cover. You can make a case through three games. Georgia's been arguably the top team in the country. On the other side of this thing, Vanderbilt, everybody knows the story there. Uh, bad loser to East Tennessee State in week one. Came back, got a win against Colorado State in week two. Last truth is I don't even know who won the Vandy Stanford game. I really don't even care. Uh, last Saturday, this is not a team of very much consequence for me. They are, what, 35-point home underdogs against Georgia on Saturday. You do not see that kind of spread a lot, certainly in SEC play. But the dog's looking to get to 4-0 and nonetheless. So, uh, Mike Griffith, your thoughts on Georgia minus 35 on the road in conference play. What do you think? Yeah, you know, this game looks too – it almost looks too easy. It just anytime something looks like this obvious of a pick, it scares me a little bit, uh, makes me wonder. Um, you know, we saw Georgia didn't finish against South Carolina. They got shut out in the fourth quarter uh, at home. You, you wonder how many starters, how soon Kirby pulls guys out. This is really his last opportunity 
uh, to play a lot of the second and third and fourth stringers with Arkansas and Auburn on deck. So the number scares me a little bit, um, but I think the Georgia offense is even scarier. So I'm going to take Georgia to win this game 52 to 10. Wow. How about that? By the way, a source close to the program is telling me that Stanford did beat Vanderbilt last week by a score 41, 23 for those of you that like to just make sure you have full picture of what's going on here. So Mike gives Georgia a big score there on the road. Jeff Sintel, do you agree? Yeah, I think um, from watching that game last week with Stanford, you saw that uh, the Vanderbilt quarterback, former three-star Ken Seals, I think, likes to throw the ball short and dump it out to the flats. Uh, That, to me, is a dire place to put the ball when you're dealing with the Georgia football defense. Uh, I liked. I, I thought about this game, and Mike was right to say overthink it, and maybe it's a little too easy. But I thought the best case scenario here: Vanderbilt gets 13 points, and then I go, can Georgia get 48 points on Vanderbilt? Simple enough. I think Georgia will win this game, and I think they will cover. I think it's going to be something like 48 to 10, that kind of victory. Much like the quarterback's throw, short and dumpy would also describe a good portion of the Vanderbilt student body there as well. Connor Riley, oh, what do you on. think? Come on. I have friends that went to Vanderbilt that are perfectly wonderful people. Come on. There's no need to insult the students there. I Look, I'll keep it short and sweet here. This could be 49 points, and I would still take Georgia here. I think Vanderbilt's going to struggle to score. I think this offense is going to look to put up points again, get the running game on track and involved there as well. So give me Georgia here, minus 35. Uh, Dog Nation daily listeners and viewers agree to the tune of 94%. They take Georgia minus 35. The problem, though, is we saw this last week that – you can be the best team by a wide margin, but a 30-plus point spread opens the door for a lot of variance to occur where late score puts the game back under the number. That's why Georgia's just 2-7 and seven in its last nine games when favored by 30-plus points. And it ought to be as simple as that, that you just don't cover this big of a spread, especially on the road in the SEC. The one reason, though, why I'm tempted to go the other direction, Vanderbilt's actually pretty terrible at home when being given a lot of points. You know, go back over the course of since 2017, when when an underdog of 17 or more points uh, at home, Vanderbilt's two and six against the spread. So when expected to lose by a lot at home, they typically do. 35 is still just a lot. I don't have a great feeling about this really one way or another, but I guess I'll take Vandy plus the 35 just because I think it's hard to cover that big of a spread. Uh, Vanderbilt is two and three as a 20 plus point underdog against the spread since the start of the 2019 season. So a little bit better when getting even more points. So give me Vandy plus 35 in a game that I don't think is close, but maybe inside the point spread by a tiny margin. The flow, though, on the side of Georgia. Uh, Dar, you want to go with the flow and take the dogs? Uh, I, I do. I mean, it's a big number. 35 points is is, is a lot. Um, Georgia is just 3-10 and 10 against the spread in their last 13 games, one being favored by 28 or more points. So typically they don't cover a number this big, but I think this is a game of accountability. I think this is a game that you really want to open a can of whoop ass on Vandy, uh, especially given last year, how they shafted Georgia by not giving the seniors their, their moment. I think you, as Georgia, I think they need to, to, to do this in honor of those seniors by just, absolutely mopping up Vanderbilt. I think they're going to easily cover this score, and I think they're going to easily cover the over number by themselves. Wow. Well, well, that's a strong pick. And I'm calling it right now, the defense is going to score again for their fourth consecutive game. I love that. Good stuff from Dari all the way around. By the way, I also have to compliment you on your fashion choice there as well. The Dog Nation Invasion T-shirt. Of course, R.S. Andrews is a big part of that. We were in Charlotte for the season opener against Clemson. Dari showing off his Dog Nation Invasion T-shirt. Dari, that looks really good. Yeah. You know, got, very the, impressive. got the threads. Very nice. Good job. Very, very impressive. I'm very proud of that T-shirt. All right, so we'll come back to Georgia before we're done with today's show. Go with the flow presented by R.S. Andrews. Let's turn our attention now to other games in the SEC. And for our next one, Texas A&M and Arkansas, I have to admit – I love this game from a TV standpoint. Boy, I am really scared of this game, but from a gambling standpoint, I'm honestly genuinely curious of what the rest of our team has to say about what's going to go down here. For Texas A&M, it's been a rocky start to the season with the injury to Haynes King, the starting quarterback, struggled in a road win against Colorado, came back, got healthy last week, at least uh, on the field against New Mexico there. For Arkansas, this team riding high after its win against Texas, no slowdown whatsoever against Georgia Southern last week. 
this possibly one of the final games to be played between these two teams there at Jerry World as this contract comes to an end in 2024. And I think that uh, Sam Pittman, despite the fact that Jerry Jones, the Cowboys owner, is a prominent booster of the Arkansas program, I think he's made it pretty clear that he's hoping to have this game back in Fayetteville there in future seasons. But for now, you're talking about Arkansas being a five-and-a-half-point underdog there in uh, in Jerry World against – I should say a five-point underdog. Let's make sure the number right. Five-point underdog from where we picked this early in the week here. Five-point underdog against Texas A&M. Uh, Mike, what do you think about the Aggies and the Hogs? Yeah, Sam recognizes it's just too valuable of a recruiting weekend to, to give a great game away like this at a neutral site. It's just not something you do in today's world. It's an outdated philosophy. I think Arkansas covers in this game. I like AM to win. Um, I think their players have been in more big games. I think they have more talent, uh, all things being equal. Um, I, I'm going to take the Aggies to win, but I'm going to take the Razorbacks to cover. So let's make sure Michael Carvel gets that right. I'm taking Arkansas on the points, uh, a 24-21 game. should point out that uh, A&M opened about a seven or so point favorite and uh their friends at Bet US and other houses, it's now down to more like five. We could see more line movement before this game kicks off there as well. Jeff, what do you think about the Aggies and the Hogs, the Hogs getting five? Uh, first of all, uh, fair and balanced, uh, go with the flow is what we always strive for here. And I would say that the measure of an Arkansas, Texas A&M neutral site game is not comparable to others around the country. Um, political statement there. Uh, as far as this game, I like Arkansas to win outright, so I'm certainly going to take those points. Give me Sam Pittman and those hogs playing the jukebox. I like them to win, much less I'll take those points. Connor Riley, what do you think? Look, I bet against Arkansas earlier this year against a team from Texas, and I paid dearly for it. So <laughs> not only do I think Arkansas covers here, I think they win outright. I love Texas. Uh, I love Sam Pittman in the spot. I have major questions about this Texas A&M team. I think this is not the type of Arkansas team you want to play when you have a backup quarterback and you struggle to move the ball against a Colorado team that, by the way, lost 30 to nothing to Minnesota last week. Give me Arkansas here. Give me Sam Pittman screaming, yes, sir, from Jerry World. Give me Arkansas money line and give me Arkansas plus five. So Dog Nation Daily listeners and viewers, as you might imagine, they agree. They love Sam Pittman. 71% have Arkansas plus the points here, and you'd assume a good number of those will also like Arkansas on the field there as well. I mentioned this in our lead-in. I love the game on TV. I think this is a fantastic game to watch. I don't like this game from a gambling standpoint because, boy, it's just to me, it's hard to get a great handle on this. First of all, a couple of trends worth knowing. Jimbo Fisher's actually never covered the spread versus Arkansas in three previous attempts as A&M coach. 0-3 there in that spot. This will be his fourth try. A&M did finish on a hot note last year, though, when it comes to the spread in SEC games covering final five of their final seven in 2020. Of course, this is their first SEC game here for the 2021 season. Arkansas' Sam Pittman has been red hot against the numbers since becoming Razorbacks coach, 10-3, and three, spanning two seasons over 13 games uh, against the spread there as the Arkansas coach. You know, for me, this comes down to a lot of people wanting to hang a little bit of a sign on Texas A&M's back as an overrated team because of what happened in Denver against Colorado a couple of weeks ago. But the truth is, is I thought that game proved more about Texas A&M than it didn't. They lost their starting quarterback, and they still found a way to win that game. They were an easy winner last week, which I don't take much into that one way or another. You know, this is, an, this is a Texas A&M team that's not great offensively. It, it's certainly not. But, boy, when you talk about finding a way to win this game by a touchdown, if I'm forced to make a pick, I will take Texas A&M. The truth is, when the number was real big early, I thought it was very easy to probably like uh, Arkansas there. And as the game gets closer and the point spread maybe gets more narrow, which it seems like that's the direction we're going, it becomes a little easier to like Texas A&M. We're kind of stuck in the middle here at five. So I'm forced to, to lean in a direction. Minus the five, I will take Texas A&M. Dari, the flow, though, on the side of the hogs, you want to go with the flow and take Sam Pittman and the Razorbacks. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with the flow. I'm going to take uh, Arkansas here. Uh, to to cover in this game, uh, even though they've lost nine straight against the Aggies, uh, one of the things they've covered twelve of their last fifteen games. So you know, Aggies have a really good defense, but their offense has been pitiful. Uh, I, I just like Arkansas uh, on the lines. I think they're gonna 
be able to have some success running that ball. They have a top 10 rushing offense in football right now. I think this game is close. It's one of my favorite ones to watch this yeah. weekend. It's going to come down, I think, to the very, very end of this game. Yeah, I agree with you, Daria. I think it's a great game to watch and a really pretty fascinating window into where we might be going the rest of the way here in the SEC. But, man, you better make sure you got a good handle on this if you're going to put that money down on it, which is why we're sharing these opinions right now. A game that used to be this big and now no longer what it once was is uh, Florida hosting Tennessee back in the decade of the 1990s. This may have been the premier rival in the SEC there for a while with Phil Former there with the balls and Steve Spurrier obviously coaching at Florida. Uh, the Tennessee team right now, I'd say, is a team that's probably fallen on pretty hard times all the way around. And Florida coming off of what's being described in games was the greatest loss of all time in their narrow two-point defeat to Alabama a week ago. They also host Tennessee on Saturday as 20-point favorites, according to our friends there at BetUS. So, Gators minus 20 against a once hated rival. Mike, I know you've covered a ton of these games. What do you think about Florida and Tennessee? Yeah, Florida's playing really well right now. Um, really well right now. Obviously, they they were close. Um, you know, if the coach calls up, uh, if he goes for it early instead of settles for a field goal, if he calls a better two-point conversion play, um, you know, it's an opportunity for Florida to win. Uh, but I really thought Dan Mullen really cost his team an opportunity there with some of his play calls. I know that's not the the, the national narrative. Um, you know, we're supposed to reward Florida for close losses. Uh, you know, I this is this is a really tough game. I'm, I'm really on the fence on this one because, you know, Tennessee's coming off some some success. They've got a really athletic quarterback used to play at Virginia Tech. Uh, some momentum. You wonder where Florida's mind is at after a close loss like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take Tennessee to cover. G- give me Florida 34 to 20 in the swamp over Tennessee. Oh, there you go. Jeff, what do you think about the balls and the Gators? I, th- I guess, Brandon, we got to follow the greatest loss of all time with the greatest cover of all time. I think Florida. I did some very good things last week. I think they'll get some confidence. I think they'll make some uh, shot plays down the field. They'll do run game. Uh, the quarterback spot will always be watched by the uh, by those in Gainesville. I like Florida to win this game, and I like for them to cover. But part of my pick is a reflection on where Tennessee is as a program, I must admit. Yeah, and this is not a good Tennessee team right now at all. So uh, what do you think, uh, Connor, what do you think? I'll take Florida here only because of the number. If this were 21, I'd probably take Tennessee. But at 20, I, I feel like that's just enough to give me the Gators here. So give me Florida minus 21 or Dog minus Nation. 20. Dog Nation daily listeners and viewers will take the balls. That's just because they don't like Florida. They take they take Tennessee by, a, what is it, 53% margin here. So uh, this is a bunch that's not ever going to take Florida. So I don't necessarily read too much into that. Here's the one thing you should know about this game, that Florida actually finds itself in a pretty rare spot here. This is just the second time in the Dan Mullen era that Florida has been a 20 plus point, 20 or more point favorite in SEC play at home. Ironically, though, last time Florida was in this spot at the end of last season, they actually lost outright as 23 point favorites against LSU at the end of last season. They pushed in a 34 10 win against Kentucky before that. So we don't, we don't very typically see Florida in the Mullen era. 20 point favorites at home in SEC play. That's not the kind of thing that's happening a lot. And uh, you have the outright loss there. But if you had to find the perfect kind of opponent to play in what is really a letdown game, Florida laid it on the line against Alabama last Saturday. And teams typically are not as strong the week after Alabama. Uh, they that takes something out of you physically, especially when you, you know, kind of go down to the wire the way that Florida did a week ago. However, this Tennessee team is not just dreadful. They're dreadful defensively. They, they gave up more than 40 points to a, to a pit team that has scored points against everybody, but also lost last week to Western Michigan. So, so if you're losing to a team that's losing to Western Michigan, that tells you all you need to know about Tennessee. This is not a good team, and specifically on defense. That means the physical toll of playing Alabama maybe doesn't show up this much uh, this week against Tennessee. This is another game that I'm kind of feeling my way around blindly but it just seems relatively safe to take the Gators here. If they were on the road at Kentucky this week, which is where they'll be next week, I think it's an entirely different conversation today. But staying at home against a pillow soft opponent, this to me feels like the kind of game that Florida ought to be able to handle, even minus a sizable number. So I'll take the Gators minus the 20. But the flow here, though, I believe on the side of the balls, Dar, you want to go with the flow and take Tennessee? 
Oh man, I, I've been going back and forth on this all week. Even right now, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of seesawing. Um, yeah, I've, n- I've no, you know, sight of, in this game. Well, let me ask you other. this before you make. Let me ask you before you make your pick. Do you agree with my logic that if you're playing a team that's tougher defensively, if you're on the road this week, that's an automatic go against Florida. If, if Florida's in a different spot this week, I would go against them against a lot of SEC teams. But playing at home against a bad defense, to me, it just makes taking Florida minus a big number a lot easier to swallow. It does. I mean, you know, I think with the with Bama, it kind of gives them some confidence that they were able to hang and they were in that game and, and they'll be able to carry that. I, you know, I've just been going back and forth. Do they lose sight of that? Right? Was that like you know their greatest loss, like that big of a success, and they kind of lose a little bit of focus this week yeah. just because they know Tennessee's not that good and. You know, at 20 is a lot of points. You know, I have Florida penciled in here, but I'm going to take – I'm going to switch it. I'm going to take the points with Tennessee. Okay. Um, just because I don't think For- Florida is going to be as crisp and focused uh, this week. A little let down. I'm sorry, I'll say this to our audience. If, if, if they are serious about placing a bet on this game, I would invite people to do some research on what has been written over the years about teams the week after they play Alabama – you know, teams typically want their bye week before Alabama. There's been a lot of good stuff over the years about if you're really smart, you might put your bye week the week after Alabama because, man, there's a lot of losing and a lot of underperforming that goes on the week after that game for obvious reasons. Alabama just takes a lot out of you. So you have to take a little bit of a flyer here to assume that won't happen to Florida. I think the quality of the opponent matters here, and the venue certainly matters there as well. But, Dari, for the people who really are serious about this game, I'd invite folks to do their own research about teams the next week after Alabama, because the results over the years have not been pretty. Well, what, what what's it look like the week after teams play Tennessee Tech, Brandon? Yeah, I mean, there's also that there as well. Because they got to play everybody on the roster in a 56-0 to win. I got to think they're pretty rested. So we shall see how that plays out when you roll in there um, uh, on Saturday. We'll go elsewhere in the SEC now. The team we talked about at the top of our program, Mississippi State, hard luck loser at Memphis last week gets a chance to come back home and they find themselves in the same spot they were in two weeks ago as just slightly less than a field goal underdog this time with LSU coming in. And boy, after what happened uh, for LSU in week one against UCLA, in fact, UCLA then lost last week, this sort of feels a little bit like a last stand for Ed Orgeron's charges that uh, if LSU is going to have anything to show for itself this year, revenge game against the Mississippi state team that beat it up pretty good in week one last year, that feels like a uh, pretty important spot here. Of course, Starkville's been the site of some very weird LSU-Mississippi State games over the years. So LSU finds itself two-and-a-half-point road favorite at Mississippi State. Mike Griffith, what do you think about the game? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of a last stand for Mike Leach, too. I mean, that, that's tough. That's a tough loss up, you know, up there at Memphis. You're not supposed to lose that game. This would be a really tough loss at home. I think you could lose the team if you get beat. Um, conversely, uh, LSU, as you said, revenge factor. Uh, I, I, and again, cream rises to the top. I, I think LSU wins more easily than we might think. I'm taking LSU 35 to 24. Jeff, what do you think? Yes, first of all, can we assure me that the SEC officials are working this game? Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm not at this point, Tom. I'm not sure that's what Mississippi State even wants. I mean, probably two number fours on the field would be a good play call for Ed Orgeron and his offense right now. Um, I'm going to say uh, this is one of those, if you said that Mississippi State was getting 2.5 or LSU was getting 2.5, that would be a head scratcher as well. I think you just got to go brand names here. I think LSU has better players. I think they've always had better players. And I think a little bit of that gumbo stew about last year and Coach O's got to get some mojo going, all that stuff. I like for LSU to win this game by about seven points, so I'll certainly take those points. Uh, what do you think, Connor? I, I think you sort of touched on it. This is a game Ed Ogeron can't lose because their schedule after this, they host Auburn at Kentucky, you know, home a game against Ole Miss, and then they're at – they got Florida in there as well. They are about to start on a daunting stretch mm-hmm. here where they're going to play a bunch of physical and tough teams – And if you start that stretch off by losing to Mississippi State, even if it's on the road, I can tell you one thing. If if they lose this game on Saturday, Ed Ogeron will not be the head coach at LSU next season. So I I, I think they have to rally around him, and I do think they're going to do that, and I think they're going to get a win this weekend. I think they're going to cover that spread. 
And I think they're going to beat Mississippi State on the road. Yeah, I'm going to really try and not to overthink this one. I think I've been guilty of maybe overthinking, overthinking all three of our previous games. I'm going to try not to overthink this one. Um, I heard Jeff say LSU has better players. They do. I think we all agree that this is kind of a last stand type game for Orgeron. You know, LSU the last couple of years has still been power rated as a top 10 team by most of the professional gamblers, even though they've lost plenty on the field. At a certain point in time, you have to start rethinking it. Does LSU even still belong in that category of a team that you trust against the number? This is that game where you prove that. I, I simply don't think Mississippi State's very good, though. So it's as much going against Mississippi State, even at home, as it is going for LSU. Um, it's a small number that feels safe to me. I'll take LSU. This game is as easy as a pick as any. By the way, Dog Nation, daily listeners and viewers agree there, too. They take LSU to the tune of 64% here. So a lot of love on the Tigers right now. Dari, what do you think? Uh, no, I'm, I'm taking Mississippi State here at home. Uh, I know you're boycotting the state of Mississippi, uh, but I prefer to buy the hook here to get it to three. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think LSU is just on a two-year hangover from the Natty. You know, they haven't looked good. They can't run the ball. Mississippi State, for one thing that they are good at, is they're really good at stopping the run. I think that's that those two things colliding together, and they're playing at home. I'm going to take the home dog with points. Yeah, but I we should it. also point out, historically for college football teams, those favored by two and a half have a winning record against teams favored by three, much the same way teams favored by three and a half have a winning record by against teams that are favored by three. Kind of a little bit of an, you know, an odd twist there, but the half point has certainly proven to matter they're in those situations. Yeah. And I think, I think like even they, you know, they could lose from here on out and Ed Orgeron's not going to lose his job next year. I think this is already chalked Ooh, up as, Hey, and they may, he may be on a hot seat. I don't think he's, I think they're perfectly fine, especially with the hurricane that they're dealing with there. I mean, there's just a lot of things going on and, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like they're, it's a home of Mardi Gras, man. That's like a, two, it's like a two. Sorry, they go, they they're lose like a party. Out. They, like the they lose out. They lose six straight games. Ed Ogeron's not finishing the season there. I, I think I if like he, it's not so much – they're not going to fire him after this game like they did less miles after he lost to Auburn. But if you lose this game, that's a terrible sign for the teams you have on the rest of your schedule. Yeah. And that schedule is not easy. And because of that, schedule's I think it's schedule. going to get worse. You lose this game, lose five games. I mean, it, it is what it is. They they already got – you know, the, they're still drinking booze out of the, the trophy. They are doing you that. Know? Yeah, it's a it's a two year party. It's a little bit of hangover, and you got a hurricane season that hit them pretty hard. Like it's just whatever. I think they're it's a it's a chalk it up again year. Circle the wagons, come back next year. That's what's going to happen. That they probably lose this game uh, this weekend. Of course, good point there by Dari Payro. Don't forget uh, Dari Payro, part of RS Andrews, which brings the RS Andrews cool down to you each and every week here, and they can also take care of you for your air conditioning. Heating, plumbing, electric needs. That means if your water heater goes out, in any case, R.S. Andrews can replace it for you the same day. So reach out, find out what so many of our folks in the Dog Nation audience have found out. But story after story, R.S. Andrews has delivered smiles, and they can deliver one for you there as well. And hopefully our picks will deliver some smiles for you there as well. In fact, let's go back and take a look at our next game now as Kentucky travels to South Carolina. Another one of these kind of tricky lines kind of in between that field goal touchdown range. This time Gamecock is getting five points at home against the uh, Wildcats of Kentucky. Of course, South Carolina, you saw them last week, get thoroughly dominated against Georgia, but keep it between, you know, keep it inside the number there in that spot. Kentucky, though, uh, a little bit of trouble uh, last week, a a week ago, having its challenges with UT Chattanooga, only winning by a final of 28 to uh, 23. So a little bit of a surprise for Mark Stoops' team there. Uh, Mike, what do you make of Kentucky favored by five on the road here against South Carolina? Yeah, this this is another this is another tough game like that Tennessee Florida game. I, I wouldn't touch it uh, as far as betting on it. Just you know, South Carolina showed some. I, I really like Luke Doty. I, I know what the final score said, but that guy made some throws and some plays. Uh, four plays longer than thirty five yards. Uh, I was impressed with how gritty the Gamecocks played. Uh, you know, and this is this is going to be their SEC home opener. So. Uh, I, I kind of like South Carolina to, to win this game outright. Kentucky, I know they hired Eddie Grant, and if you ask those people, that's uh, like Amos Alonzo Stag to, to those folks. They they think Bill Belichick's trying to hire him or something like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna take, and, and this is a real opportunity for you guys to make up some ground. You don't have to just keep making the same picks as me. Um, that's why you got me going first. I know I'm gonna take South Carolina though in the upset, 26-24. Jeff, what do you think about the Wildcats and the Gamecocks? 
Well, it's always funny how Mike gets a chance to brush his shoulders off as we, he makes every pick here on this thing, holding the crown like Jerry Lawler from <laughs> uh, old wrestling phase. Um, I like, here's what I like about this game. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to recycle some chatter that I think Brandon used uh, regarding Alabama football. I think this Georgia football team is so dominant and so powerful that the week after you play Georgia, there's a little bit of a hangover from the physicality, from just the wear and tear going against Georgia's personnel, which does rival an Alabama roster right now. I like uh, I like South Carolina to win this game, but I don't like them to cover. Um, so give me Kentucky in those points right now. Well, to be fair, South Carolina is the underdog here in this spot. South Carolina is giving five? Yeah, giving South Carolina is getting five, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, I still like that. I still like – give me Kentucky. All right, sounds good. Uh, Connor, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to steal points of analysis from both Jeff and Mike there. Uh, I, I think the physicality factor a week after playing Georgia might show show up against South Carolina. Uh, again, playing a, a physical Kentucky team or at least a team that tries to play physical. And I need to make up some ground on Mike, so I'm gladly going to take Kentucky here uh, minus the five points and do what I can to try and climb up these standings. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, Dog Nation Daily listeners and viewers, they also like Kentucky here, there as well, 54% take the Wildcats over the Gamecocks minus the points. And I like Kentucky here in this spot too, despite the fact that Shane Beamer is three and up against the spread to begin his career with the Gamecocks. Um, I thought Luke Doty, as Mike said, did some nice things for South Carolina a week ago. The truth is I do believe South Carolina will win an SEC game this year. I think they'll beat Vanderbilt. I think they have a chance to beat Tennessee, but I think for a Kentucky team that really fashions itself as capable of making some noise, you got to find the easy wins on your schedule in order to be able to do that. And the truth is, this is a better Kentucky offense this year. Last week's game against uh, uh, Chattanooga notwithstanding than it's been. Levis is a good quarterback. Kind of a, you know, a Sean McVay-style offense now in place for the Wildcats. And I actually think they may make this look pretty easy against South Carolina on Saturday. The fact that it was close against the Mox a week ago only bolsters that point. I'm a little bit of a zigzag theory on stuff like this. And so get the bad game out of the way, play focused and play well against South Carolina this week in the hopes of making the Florida game next Saturday mean something for Kentucky. I probably like Kentucky as much as I like anything on the board here for this week. So minus the five, even on the road, I will take the Wildcats. That puts the flow, though, on the side of – what is the flow on? Uh, well, <laughs> that's true. That's a lot. Everybody's got Kentucky except for me, so that's got to be the flow, right? Uh, okay, is that the case? Uh, so I'll put the flow on the side of Kentucky there as well. Uh, Dar, you want to go with the flow and take the Wildcats? Well, I'm going I'm to just like everyone pointed out here, the physicality playing, you know, after Georgia. I mean, Georgia's got five star athlete, defensive lineman, 350 pounds that runs faster than everybody on this call. They're going to be feeling it this week. Well, Shane you know, Beamer reference there. I get that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I want to take South Carolina here. I like what they're kind of doing. And, and, but I just think Kentucky's going to do enough to, to snap their three game road losing streak and get a cover in this game. All right, good stuff there. We'll come back to the SEC when the show is done. We'll take another look at Georgia and Vanderbilt before we're finished. But now let's step outside the league. And the only matchup this week of top 25 foes takes us to Chicago Soldier Field, where ESPN's College Game Day will be on hand. The big noon kickoff, I believe, is it the name of the Fox show? I think that's yep. also going to be on hand for this one there as well. As Notre Dame takes on Wisconsin Badgers, six and a half point favorites. Of course, we saw Wisconsin week one lose to Penn State. We have seen Notre Dame do a whole bunch of scuffling for the most part here this season. Uh, what do you think, Mike, about whiskey and the Irish? Two things that years well ago, Notre Dame game. would have beat Georgia if it wasn't for the Sanford Stadium crowd. Notre Dame knows how to handle the big game. Uh, Brian Kelly is a great big game coach uh, outside of when he plays in the uh, college football playoffs. Uh, but but this is Chicago is all about Notre Dame. You thought those calls in Memphis were bad. Wait until you see the breaks the Irish get in the city of Chicago. Uh, you know, lefty from Aurora is, is going to be waiting in the alley if the call goes the wrong way. I'm, I'm taking Notre Dame uh, to win this game outright. Uh, I know Wisconsin is a six and a half point favorite, but give me the Irish uh, 30 to 27 over the Badgers. Jeff, what do you think? I've also got the Irish in this one. I think Mike mentioned a lot of the points there. Uh, he's right. Uh, games in September and October, the Irish play very well. The ones in December, maybe not so much. Um, Mike mentioned a couple of factors. Uh, I just think this is a game where a young man like Kyle Hamilton of Notre Dame really 
puts that tape on the uh, screen for him to be a top 10 NFL draft pick next year. That's the fabulous safety from Notre Dame. Uh, give me Notre Dame to win this one as well. Connor, what do you think? Yeah, I'd like to point out a couple of things here. One, the Jack Cone revenge game, the former Wisconsin starting Very quarterback playing his old team there. Uh, I'd also like to point out that Notre Dame actually covered the spread last year when they played Alabama in the college football playoff. Ohio State didn't do that. Georgia didn't do that last season. And while Mike and Jeff both made brilliant points, and if I was an unbiased person, I would absolutely take Notre Dame here. If people ask me for advice, I would take Notre Dame here. But because Jeff and Mike are taking Notre Dame here, because I'm trying to make up ground, and because Jeff has the absolute worst record when it comes to picks so far, I'm going to take Wisconsin here just for the sole reason of zagging here. So Connor zags, the uh, audience will join him. Uh, no uh, no Akron zips. This is the zags instead. I guess more of a college of basketball reference to Gonzaga. Nonetheless, Dog Nation daily listeners and viewers, 67% on the side of Wisconsin here. They don't like Notre Dame. Most college football fan bases don't. Here's the thing. Like, I've watched Notre Dame a few times this year. I got to tell you. Something's not right with Notre Dame. I don't know how much of our audience got a chance to see them thus far this year. They won relatively easy with Purdue last week, but you know, very quietly, Purdue's become about the worst team in the Big Ten. There's probably only a handful of teams in the Big Ten worse than Jeff Brom's uh, Boilermakers here at this point in time. But look at the first couple of games. Give up a lot of points to Toledo. Rockets may be the best team in the MAC, but you're not supposed to give up that many points to Toledo. Obviously, so close with Florida State. We've seen what Florida State's become. It's, it's kind of funny. You see Luke Fickle in Cincinnati still playing very well defensively with Marcus Freeman now in uh, South Bend. You see Freeman kind of being whispered that he may be the replacement eventually for uh, Brian Kelly as head coach there uh, with the uh, Fighting Irish. I kind of secretly don't think that Marcus Freeman's doing a very good job with this Notre Dame defense right now. Um, I think Wisconsin, despite the loss to Penn State, is probably a pretty good team. And, yeah, I mean, the point spread is – Fairly significant, six and a half is a, is a decent sized number, and it's approaching a key number of seven there as well. But something's just not right with Notre Dame, and I trust Wisconsin the spot to exploit all of that. So I will take whiskey here on this one. That puts the flow on the side of Wisconsin as well. Dar, you want to go with the flow? What do you think about Wisco in Chicago? Yeah, this is this is another tricky one. I mean, the, the, all these games this week are they, they're all hairy. Um, you know, this this game. While you know, I got some friends. Uh, you know, went to Notre Dame, and we were going to do a trip last year. Uh, this game was in Lambeau, or scheduled to be in Lambeau, right. and it, it got canceled. And then the second part of it was here in Chicago. So. Uh, it's kind of interesting where this point spread is set by Vegas at six and a half. You know, at first glance, you would think Notre Dame would be the favorite, you know, which is supposedly a neutral site in Chicago, which is really their home, second home that they have. Uh, Wisconsin's had two weeks to prep for this game um, against their old quarterback. Um, yeah. you know, I think it's going to be low scoring. All Notre Dame games have been close. They haven't played really anyone well. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know if Wisconsin can cover the six and a half points um, in this game because I, I just think it'll be close. I think there will be some calls that do tend to favor the Irish here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take the points with Notre Dame. I don't know who's really going to win this game, but uh, I'm, I'm going to end up taking the Irish and the points. To finish things off here on Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews, let's turn our attention back to Jordan Vanderbilt one more time. Over, under for the game in Nashville on Saturday, 11 a.m. local star, set at 52 and a half. And I have to confess one thing. I've gotten this over, under wrong with Georgia, spectacularly wrong each and every week, whichever side I've been on. Uh, I mean, my picks haven't been great for a couple of years anyway, but the one I just consistently get wrong is this over, under deal. So I should almost take a knee and not even make a pick on this, but – the rules dictate that I must. But before that, Mike, what do you think? UGA Vandy over under 52 and a half. Yeah, I've gotten this one right every week. Uh, I'm going to go with the over. Uh, you know, I just feel like Georgia wants to, you know, put the hammer down and finish the fourth quarter. You know, Kirby talked about, you know, even in his fiery post game speech that, you know, they didn't finish the way that he wanted. So, to me, that'll probably be one of the points of emphasis for the Bulldogs is to finish off the Commodores and reward all those George fans 
that are going to be traveling up there to Nashville to have a good time and hoping they run into Brandon Adams outside the stadium when he does the post game show. Well, hopefully I'll run into them there as well. Uh, Jeff, what do you think about the over under of 52 and a hook? Hey, Brandon, I feel you, especially on Georgia over-unders. I think the only thing I've gotten right about Georgia picking this year was the fact that they were going to beat Clemson and uh, getting those points. Um, I think this game is going to go way over that mark, and I will leave it as simple as that. Uh, Connor, what do you think? 52 and a half. Give me the over. I think Georgia scores 56 on its own. Wow. Boy, y'all are really confident. Dog Nature Daily listeners and viewers are there as well. Uh, to the tune of 88%, they like the over here in the spot. No one should pay any attention to me. As I said before, I'm just grasping the straws on this. <laughs> that still feels like a lot of points for me. Um, to win. To win for us this week. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been an easy win for everybody against me on this. <laughs> I, I'm going to go under. My, my instinct says under the 52 and a half. I, I get these wrong, but but it's my instinct, so I got to do it. Uh, Dari, I'm assuming you want to go with the flow on the over and not with me, given my uh, inability to get this correct. In fact, you've already previewed your pick on this there as well. I know you want to do that. So go ahead and make it official. Yeah, I'm going over. I mean, I like, like I think they're going to score all and cover by themselves. If there's a if there, you could put a bet on, on that to get some extra, you know, uh, odds and juice on it. I would explore what maybe bet us has that or somewhere. I think Georgia is going to cover that 52 and a half all by themselves. And I think it's going to, they're going to put an exclamation point after you spell elite this week. I think they're going to just open it up and just light up that scoreboard. Triple digits. I hope they get close to triple digits. <laughs> Speaking of bet us, we certainly appreciate them providing our point spread data for us each and every week. You go to betus.com, use the promo code DN125 and get 125%. Initial sign-up bonus. Of course, a little bit of a light slate in the SEC this week. Well, folks, when we come back and talk about these games next week, it's Georgia against a ranked opponent in Arkansas. It's Alabama and a bit of a revenge game against Ole Miss after Alabama did not play well in Oxford a year ago. Auburn, LSU, Florida on the road to Kentucky. The real slate of SEC games begins next Saturday. So that is going to be a uh, ton of fun. And what happens here this week, a little bit of a precursor for all of that. So, Dari Payro, best of luck with your picks here this week. Uh, and all the folks there at RS Andrews working really hard to keep folks and their houses in good shape when it comes to the air conditioning and heating and plumbing and electric needs. We appreciate all of your uh, doing out there for us and uh, just appreciate your insight on these picks there as well. Cool. For the rest of our Dog Nation team, Mike Griffith, Jeff Sintel, Connor Riley, thanks to all of you for being here on Go With The Flow presented by RS Andrews. Best of luck with your own picks. Good luck enjoying the games here this weekend. And we'll talk to you next week at this same time for Go With The Flow presented by R.S. Andrews.